in southern Italy, 15 miles from Naples, in the shadow of deadly Mount Vesuvius. World-famous Pompeii attracts three and a half million tourists every year. It was a hot spot in the ancient world too, famed for its gorgeous architecture and feel-good vibe. I'm gonna walk the streets of Pompeii to inhabit the ancient city and discover the greatest treasures left here just where they stood on that fateful, petrifying day in 79 AD. Abundant Street runs through Pompeii for over half a mile, an artery linking the key sites. As well as being the main thoroughfare, it's one of the very oldest in the settlement. This is a map of ancient Pompeii. Um, and if you look at Abundant Street, you can see that its development really helps us understand the evolution of the city. Um, so this is the first section that was built in the 6th century BC. And at that point, there were just six shops on it. But then look at how it expands from the 2nd century BC onwards. And by this time, there are around 58 shops here. Number nine. It's the Cave Canum, beware the dog mosaic. I really love this for so many reasons, partly because of the story it tells and partly because of the skill of its making. Um, so, so just look at this mosaic. It's made up of hundreds and hundreds of tiny tesserae, uh, which are little cubes of stone. It could take a team of highly skilled craftsmen a whole week to create a mosaic like this. Every single piece, hand cut, and laid in situ as the owners watch them work magic in front of their eyes. Just look at how the artist has conjured up this ferocious animal. The artist used these little red chips of stone inside to kind of conjure up the inside of the dog's slavering mouth. I mean, this is absolutely not just a lap dog. This is a working dog with its eyes focused, its teeth bared, it's straining at its chain. It's really ferocious. It's really, really intimidating. A warning to anyone brave or foolish enough to try to come into the house uninvited. At number eight on my countdown of the top 10 treasures of Pompeii, it's the wonderful Stabian Baths. The Stabian Baths were more than just a place to scrub up. They were somewhere everyone, from the very poorest to major players, could come to get fit and clean. A bonding experience all in this exquisite setting. If you think about it, you'd be sitting stark naked next to somebody who had much more wealth than you or a lot less, so the whole thing felt like a kind of um, collective experience. Once you were ready, it was time to face the heat. So this is the caldarium, the hot room, and, oh, my goodness, it would have been absolutely sweltering in here. Um, the walls are really cleverly designed so that they're all insulated. And then down here in this beautiful marble plunge pool, hot water would have gushed out. I mean, exactly like a, like a kind of modern-day jacuzzi. With pastries and wine on offer, the bars were the perfect place to settle in for a good old gossip and to check one another out. If you just think about it, if these walls could talk, oh my goodness, they would have quite a few Pompeian tales to tell. Once all that steamy chat got too much, you could cool off in the cold room, the Frigidarium, under this lovely domed ceiling. And we think this dome is the oldest in Roman Italy. And it has another remarkable claim to fame. Bathhouses with traditional timber ceilings posed a serious fire risk. So, using the local volcanic ash that would later bury Pompeii, the Romans invented a new fire-resistant building material to build this roof. Concrete. At number seven on my countdown, a place that's really close to my heart, this pedestrianised square takes up an area the size of the White House, right in the centre of Pompeii. 
flanked by landmark public buildings. It was the nerve centre of the city and the place to be seen. So I've wangled my way up onto the Temple of Jupiter here to get an overview. Everyone from all walks of life spent time here, from slaves to merchants to aristocrats. So this was somewhere where you really got a sense of where you belonged in the city, but also, crucially, that you belonged to something greater than yourself, the idea that was Rome. The mighty Roman Empire, stretching from Britain to the Middle East. In order to unite and wow its subjects, the Romans created a brand that could be replicated right across their ginormous territories. In each city was a showpiece, advertising Roman power, the Forum. This really was the beating heart of the place. It was somewhere that really mattered to the Pompeians, but what's quite ironic is actually this forum was just like almost any other right across the Roman Empire. That's Rome being really clever. It's saying, wherever you are, anywhere in the empire, you are still part of us. It's my treasure number six. As Vesuvius erupted, um, it shed this huge layer of ash right across the city and the whole region. But there were thousands of people trapped inside. As the ash hardened, it formed a kind of shell, and gradually, as the bodies decomposed, uh, they left these curious voids, uh, kind of human-shaped holes inside. All that was left inside were skeletons and bones of Pompeii's victims. When archaeologists later came across these cavities in the ash layer, they poured in plaster, waited for it to set, and then extracted these desperately sad human forms with the skeleton set inside. This process went some way to resurrect the men and women of Pompeii, immortalizing the outline of their bodies, the clothes they wore, and the objects they carried. When this victim was discovered back in 1984, the skeleton was so fragile and delicate, archaeologists were worried using plaster would damage the bones. So they had to come up with a brand new technique. What was poured inside the void was wax. This was then covered with plaster. The wax was melted out, and then inside it was replaced with basically a kind of glue, um, an epoxy resin. And, and the wonderful thing about this is it's much kinder to the human remains inside, to the bone material. The transparency of the resin allows us to see that this is a woman. We can see inside the cast, so we can read what's going on. Um, so have a look. You can see her feet here, and legs, there's her kneecap. Travelling up through her body there, her arms in this really kind of typical position. When she was first discovered, she was called skeleton number 15, but we now refer to her as the resin lady. The resin lady deserves to be treasured, not just because of who she is, but because of what she represents. When Mount Vesuvius erupted, it killed indiscriminately. Women, men, children, the slaves, the free, everyone. Women are generally written out of history, but because she's been preserved, we can begin to appreciate her, her life, and her story. And here it is. One of the greatest surviving artworks from the whole of Roman civilization, and my treasure number five, the world-famous fresco at the Villa of the Mysteries. Oh, my goodness. I have to say, whenever I come here, I am completely blown away by this thing. Um, it's partly because of its pure beauty, but it's also because of its pure power. Covering every inch of these walls, this painting is packed full of life-size figures, really unusual in a fresco, making it not just priceless, but truly one of a kind. 
this is really, really, really high quality work. I mean, the most expensive kind. Uh, and we know that for a few reasons. One is the colour. So it's this beautiful Pompeian red that was a very, very expensive pigment. What really strikes you is just how vivid and rich this red still is. And the secret to this fantastic colour lies in its science. The most expensive paint was made from an unusual volcanic rock called cinnabar, found in the mountains of Spain. The Romans would crush it into a powder to make the pigment, but unfortunately, this mysterious rock also contains something much more sinister. I know that um, a lot of the, of the, the, the red pigment actually um, had mercury sulphide in which is really, really, really poisonous. Actually, it's really tragic. We know that because the, um, the painters and the craftsmen who mix this up use cinnabar so much, particularly in places like the, the Villa of the Mysteries, that have been poisoning themselves, basically, because mercury is incredibly toxic. It's so incredible getting the chance to hold this. You really do feel close to, to the men, and probably some women as well, uh, female craftspeople, who use this to kind of create that beautiful art that we see. It's, just such a privilege, it's such a privilege to get close to it. At number four, it's the Lupinare brothel. There are actually around 25 locations in Pompeii that we think would have been used as brothels, but this is the most famous one. This is the Lupinare, the she-wolf's den. The infamous Lupinari is the oldest surviving purpose-built brothel in the Roman Empire. When it was first discovered, the early excavators were so shocked by what they found here, they sealed it off from the public for a whole century. The dark, stinking rooms of the Lupinari catered to Pompey's poor, market traders sailors passing through its bustling port, and even male slaves. Because the girls were illiterate, they left no record of their lives here. But amazingly, we do know of some of their names, thanks to the hundreds of intimate messages scrawled on the walls by their clients. Abia, Nika and Januaria were clearly three of the most popular girls. There's graffiti everywhere, and you can read loads of it. Um, so, I don't know if you can make this one out. So this one, for instance, says, Putiolani, Feliciter, Felicita, uh, which means um, uh, the, the men of Putioli, which is a nearby imperial port. Uh, the, kind of, they're great, go men, you know, you're fantastic. The graffiti reveals the cost of a visit to the Lupinare was as little as two as, enough to buy a couple of glasses of Pompeian wine if you were lucky. It's treasure number three in our countdown of top ten treasures of Pompeii, the city's groundbreaking amphitheatre. This is a treasure you just can't miss. It's actually the biggest building in the whole of Pompeii. It is a hugely impressive, jaw-droppingly amazing open-air arena that could accommodate up to 20,000 people in a single day. Originally called a spectacular, as the first amphitheatre to be built in stone in the whole of the Roman world, this treasure of Pompeii was truly innovative. I love coming to this place um, just after dawn because you get to share it with all the lizards as they're waking up. It feels a real privilege. Nothing captures what made the people of Pompeii tick quite like this place. The punters were here for blood, gore and machismo. From animal hunts to the biggest draw of all, the world-famous gladiator fights. Where you got to sit depended on your sex and your social status. Uh, so these seats down at the front were reserved for the elite, where it was thrillingly, uh, sometimes dangerously, close to the action. But as a non-elite woman, I'd have had to struggle all the way up here because women were relegated to the cheap seats right at the back. Even the posh women were sent to sit up here. 
Just like our arenas today, you could buy fast food and drink from vendors. But this was entertainment with a dark heart. Proof to Romans and non-Romans alike that this was a civilization that triumphed through fear, conquest, and a kind of macho virility. It's our treasure number two. The jaw-dropping House of Menander. When archaeologists started digging here in the 1920s, they had little idea of what lay in store under layers of volcanic rock. An incredible house with more than 40 rooms, measuring a colossal 2,000 square metres. That's as big as Clarence House, the home of Britain's Prince of Wales. So you're in for a treat. This is no ordinary house. It's more like a 2,000-year-old party palace. Let me show you around as we hunt for clues that link the house to Rome's wildest hedonists. It's all about flaunting it. I mean, look at this view. Talk about a high-impact entrance. It's saying, I am fabulously wealthy. It took six whole years to fully excavate this enormous house, and archaeologists became increasingly puzzled as to who on earth could afford this lifestyle of luxury. OK, I've got to admit, I've been slightly rebellious, and I'm, I'm, I'm not actually doing what I should be doing. I'm not doing as the Romans did, cos they would not have ploughed through their beautiful ornamental gardens. But, oh, I just couldn't resist it, cos this is box, and it's so, so beautiful. The Romans also liked to plant rosemary and oleander, all wafting up under the gorgeous Mediterranean sun. It is very, very, very sensuous. The mystery of who owned this house endured for another decade, when archaeologists uncovered a clue which could solve the puzzle. Two skeletons were found, and next to them was, a, was a, just a little ring. It wasn't anything particularly fancy, but on it were written the words Q Popeus. And brilliantly, that gives us the name of the people who owned this place. So Quintus Popeus was a wealthy man from a wealthy family. So suddenly, we can start to piece together the story of the people who lived here. The Popeus family were extremely well connected and one notorious member even married into Rome's imperial family. Poppaea Sabina was the second wife of the pretty highly coloured Roman Emperor Nero, and all kinds of things were said about her. Um, it was gossiped that she put golden shoes onto the hooves of her mules, that she bathed in ass's milk, and even that she'd encourage Nero to murder his own mother because she was getting in the way of their passionate romance. When it comes to choosing my number one, it's not the incredible mosaics, buildings and frescoes that make Pompeii so special. It's something much more tragic. Probably the most famous and also the most disturbing remnants of the eruption of Vesuvius are the victims, that the people of the city. Trapped in their final excruciating moments, each of these casts tells a story of the final seconds of the individuals who lived here. The couple who died in a loving embrace. The slave still trapped in his shackles. The mule driver holding his head in his hands. But there's one cast in particular that never fails to break my heart every time I see it. This young child is incredibly moving because he's a symbol of the truth of the appalling tragedy that happened here and of the lives that were interrupted. And that's why he deserves to be respected and cherished as our number one. The child was found in one of Pompeii's grandest villas, next to a man and a woman holding another small infant, most likely his family. <laughs> 